Welcome back to another video as part of the AP Psychology course series. This is lesson number five on statistics and research. And basically what this video is going to highlight is some of these statistical concepts that we are concerned with in AP Psychology and ultimately um, why statistics are important for psychologists, how it is used to represent certain things, and so let's get right into it. First we have descriptive statistics, which is when you are trying to organize and summarize data. And so right off the bat, first thing you'll probably notice if you're watching this video is the three terms, the mean, the median, and the mode. These are three terms that are the same three terms you've heard probably your whole life in terms of your schooling career. They are meaning the same thing. And so these three terms are part of the measures of central tendency. The mode is the most frequent observation, MO for most often. The median is the middle observation. Think about if you place your data from um, lowest to highest, it is dividing up, it's in the middle. The same way that a uh, divider line in a highway, or the median, is dividing the left lane and the right lane. And then you have the mean, which is the average. In this case, you just add up your data and you divide by the total amount of data sets, and that gives you the most, uh, excuse me, the average number. And so sometimes these terms can be misleading because you don't always know uh, what is necessarily true. An example I'll say about this is geography majors from a university in North Carolina, specifically UNC Chapel Hill, their mean salary is over $100,000. Now if I was to take another university let's say UNC Charlotte, the mean salary for a geography major here is only $30,000. And so if you're a student and you're looking at colleges and you're thinking, well, you know, I'm interested in geography. Wow, one of these schools has a pretty significantly higher average salary than the other one. What's going on here? I'm going to definitely apply there because I think I'm going to get, you know, all that extra money. The reality is UNC Chapel Hill happened to have a famous graduate who received a degree in geography. This graduate was Michael Jordan. You may know this Michael Jordan as the same NBA player, Michael Jordan, who was uh, widely considered the greatest, if not one of the greatest of all time. That's beyond the point, but Michael Jordan made tons of money. He did not make tons of money necessarily with his geography major. So when you're looking around for these types of uh, data, it's important to know that sometimes you may want to know more than the mean. It would have really helped you in this situation to know the mode or even the median. Um, I would argue probably the mode would be most important here because you want to know what is the most frequent observation. What is the most likely salary I'm going to get? If you have a hundred people who graduate with salaries of thirty thousand dollars and you have Michael Jordan who uh, attains a billion dollars over the uh, life of his career you're probably going to not expect to get a billion dollars. You're going to expect the $30,000 salary. So this is just some ways of how these terms can be misleading. It's important to notice the difference. Another way that we describe the data is through looking at the range, the variation, and the standard deviation. And so the range is really simple. It just means what is the difference between the lowest and the highest score? What is that gap? So if we only have two pieces of data, let's say uh, family salary, one person makes a million dollars a year and the other person makes $30,000 a year, our gap is between those two numbers. If you have a whole bunch of data, then the gap exists between whatever that lowest piece of data is, whatever that low value is, and then whatever the highest value is. Variation is looking at how similar or diverse the scores are. If you look at a basketball player over a series of 10 games, and over those games they're scoring between 20 and 25 points every game, they are uh, having a very similar variation or the variability is low. You can basically predict if there was an 11th game, they're probably going to get you 22 points. But if you look at that same basketball player over another series of games, in some games they're scoring 5 points, in some games they're scoring 35 points, now the scores are very diverse, so it doesn't have that uh, low variability. There's actually a very high variability. And so you don't know in that 11th game, are they going to have a 5-point game or are they going to have a 35-point game? 
So one of the ways we look to try to control some of this data and measure it better is standard deviation. And this means how much scores vary around the mean or the average score. A good example of this is just referencing what is called the bell curve or the normal distribution. And so you can look at this picture here. This is um, a normal distribution of intelligence or IQ. And so this is based off the Weschler Intelligence Scale. And basically what it says is that the average IQ is 100. The way they get this number is they find that when people take the IQ test, 68% of people are scoring between the range of 85 and 115. And so that means that the average is then 100. And so on this chart here, the bell curve, 95% of people will then encompass the next standard deviation. So in the blue, that is just minus or plus one standard deviation of the mean. In the orange, it is minus or plus two standard deviations of the mean. And then in the lighter blue, it is plus or minus three standard deviations of the mean. And so each time you are encompassing more and more of the population. So the general rule of thumb here is that plus or minus one standard deviation is 68% of the population, plus or minus two standard deviations is now up to 95% of the population, and plus or minus three standard deviations is 99.8% of the population. Anything beyond this basically goes into extremes of very severe intellectual disability or very profound levels of giftedness. So if something ever has a normal distribution, this chart here will always be the same. The only thing that will change may be the numbers across the bottom, which are the mean. On this chart, it is 55 to 145. But uh, we'll go over this a little bit more later in terms of how you might see a question pertaining to this. Next, we have uh, another statistical concept. It's very simple. It basically is just a number. And this is called a correlation coefficient. And what this number is doing is trying to show how strong or how weak an association is between two variables. And so our correlation coefficient does two things. One, it tells us is it a positive correlation or is it a negative correlation? And the second thing that it tells us is well how strong of an association is this? And so uh, I'll give you some examples of this in just a second. If you take a look here at these charts you have some basic scatter plots and so you have a positive correlation this means that when one of your values is going up, the other value is also going up as well. Or if one value was to go down, the other value is also going to go down. In a negative correlation, though, the values are now inversely proportional. When one value goes up, the other value goes down. Or if one value goes down, the other value goes up. So let me give you some examples of some positive correlations first. One would be a GPA or SAT score. So the higher your GPA, the more likely you probably are going to have a better SAT score. So one value is high, so is the next. Or education and salary. The more years of schooling that you endure, the more likely it is that you have a, a higher salary. And the last one would be um, if you suffer from depression. If you suffered from depression, you would actually have a higher rate of suicide as compared to somebody who does not have depression. So in these cases, all the values go up on one value, and they also go up on the other value. Next, we have some negative correlation examples. So the first one would be car weight and miles per gallon. So generally, the heavier your car, the lower amount of miles per gallon you're going to get. So one value is going up. This is the weight of the car. The other value is lower. This is the miles per gallon. Um, another one would be vaccinations and illnesses. So if more people get vaccinations for a specific illness, then the uh, less likely chance of that illness to occur. So a high amount of vaccinations, a low amount of the actual illness occurring. Now the opposite can also be true. If not a lot of people get vaccinations for this illness, then it is very popular, very common. So one value is low, the other one is high. Those are basically some examples of positive and negative correlations. 
it's very important to abandon the idea of thinking that something is going to be good or something is going to be bad when you consider the positive or negative. That's not necessarily going to be the case. So in terms of the strength of the correlations, basically your numbers are going to fall between a plus one and a minus one. All correlations fall between this. The higher the correlation, the more accurate uh, the prediction. Correlations do not mean the causation. And so if you're asked to pick out a number that is showing the strongest correlation, the strongest correlation is going to be the number closest to a minus one or a plus one. If you are getting a number that's 5.72 and a number that is 0.99, the strongest correlation is the 0.99 because 5.72 is not showing any type of correlation. Now, the tricky part of this is looking at the uh, negative correlations. And so whenever you see these numbers, you want to think in terms of absolute value. So if you have a negative 0.99 and a positive 0.95, the stronger correlation is actually that negative 0.99. So I'm thinking of it in terms of an absolute value. The negative symbol at the beginning is really only telling us is it a positive or negative uh, correlation. It's not telling us necessarily the strength. And so keep that in mind when you're looking at a multiple choice question that has a bunch of different numbers uh, to not let yourself get confused by just the negative. And then another part of statistics that we have is the inferential statistics. And these are used to interpret data and draw conclusions one main thing that we are concerned with is um, looking at something called statistical significance. And basically, if something is labeled statistically significant, then the researchers have basically came to the conclusion that it probably wasn't likely that the results happened by chance. Or if it did, it was very low. In this case, uh, less than 500. Now, to take a look at some possible questions that you might see that would reference the normal distribution, there's a multiple choice question here. So it says, for a language test with normally distributed scores, the mean was 70 and the standard deviation was 10. Approximately what percentage of test takers score 60 and above? And so the way that you want to answer this question is to either draw out or envision a uh, normal distribution or a bell curve. And when you do that, all you have to do is now put the middle number which they give you as 70 right down the middle of that bell curve. And so now your values are going to go up or down by 10. So if you plus one standard deviation, your next number is now at 80. If you minus the standard deviation, that number is 60. And so they want to know what percentage scores as 60 or above. And so to do this, I'm going to have to envision it, uh, envision it in my mind here, but basically what I'm going to do is on my paper, I'm going to draw out a bell curve. I put a 70 in the middle and then a 60. And so the I'm just going to add up the percentages of the scores who got the 60 and above. And so for me, that's going to be 34%, another 34%, a 14%, a 2%, and then a 0.1. And so when you add up all of those numbers, you have 34 and 34, that's 68. You have 14, which takes you to 82. And then you have 2%, which takes you to 84. So your answer is going to end up being D. There's another version of this uh, here. If you want to try another question, you can do so. Uh, I believe for this one, uh, I'll pause and give you a second to try to answer it if you don't want to know the answer right away. All right, so uh, if you need to pause the video for more time, please do that now. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and let you know that the answer is A, 2%. And the way that you get this is basically just like the last one. Now your mean is 40. And so you would just replace on your last graph, if you did the math for the other one, you're replacing that 70 with a 40. And you are going up standard deviations of 15. And so the next number would be then 55. And then you get 70. So on your, um, on your normally distributed graph or your bell curve, the amount of people that score higher than a 70 is only 2.1%. And so that's how you're getting A. Uh, another thing that you can find out is variance. So standard deviation is the square root of variance. So if you're given a variance, you can find what your standard deviation is just by simply 
um, looking for the square root or squaring it. So uh, the only way you can get a variance of 100 would be to have 10 squared, which is going to give you the standard deviation. Here again is the bell curve if you want to reference that again for doing those math problems. If you are still confused at all on those, then come back to this. Basically that number down the middle, the 100, that's your mean. And so you would change that based on the word problem that you give. Everything else up there would stay the same. You just are going to have to adjust those numbers around the mean if it goes up by 10 or 15 or 30 or whatever they end up giving you. Uh, also, I want to show you what some skewed frequency distributions will look like. And so what you would notice right away is that the mean is very sensitive to uh, being skewed. And so it's very sensitive to uh, high scores or low scores. And so oftentimes it's better for people to show or represent their data with a median because it is not going to be quite as extreme. In the case of the uh, negative one on the left, you have a bunch of people who might score really well on a test and then a few people who score low, it's going to really pull down the mean. So the average score is going to look kind of crappy. But the median score will kind of balance out because it is kind of in the middle. So the same thing happens on the other end of this, on the positive end. You have a positive, to, a positive skewed frequency distribution. The mean is, again, sensitive to the most often scores. And so it's going to be pulled down. And then lastly, just to highlight a difference between bar graphs and histograms, bar graphs are usually to show categories and they have no gaps between them. In this case, this is looking at some amount of money between different countries. And so each country is going to be different. And so it is not showing a number range without gaps, like in the right picture, the histogram. So basically, that is the difference. Bar graphs have gaps and they show categories. Histograms, on the other hand, have no gaps and they look at number ranges. And that pretty much concludes this video. So hopefully you've learned something and I'll see you next time.